Hello everyone, I'm Vanita Sakar, Senior Media Relations Manager at the University of St. Thomas. Joining me now is President Julie Sullivan. Thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome, thank we're, you. We're excited to hear about the priorities of the university. You outlined them in your State of the University speech. There's so much to talk about and we want to highlight some of them. First and foremost, the 2020 Strategic Plan. So many accomplishments, so many things that this university has achieved as a whole. What are some of the biggest highlights for you? You know, I think the biggest highlights are the ones that were related to advancing our mission. Advancing our mission of uh, serving the common good and advancing our mission of serving our students. So for example, in terms of advancing our common good mission, three things stand out for me. First, of course, the establishment of the Doherty Family College and the, our ability to break down barriers for students who are committed to and able to pursue a four-year degree. If you look at the statistics in this country, it is predicted by, I believe it's 2027, that 70% of the jobs in our country will require a four-year degree. And it's predicted to be even higher in the state of Minnesota because our economy is so focused on jobs that require advanced degrees. In fact, we're ranked number 10 in the country in terms of the advanced degrees that our employment requires. If those are the, quote, hurdles to be in the most prosperous careers and jobs today, don't we want everybody to have that chance? And so the Doherty Family Col College, in terms of breaking down that barrier and giving these really well-deserving students the opportunities to get on a successful pathway to a four-year degree is certainly one. Uh, the second, w in terms of advancing our common good, would be about our School of Education. During these uh, five years of this past strategic plan, uh, we stood up a freestanding School of Education. Uh, we hired Dean Kathleen Campbell as our new dean, and she and her colleagues have really been focused on addressing the opportunity gaps in Minnesota. We know that we rank almost dead last as a state in this country in terms of the percentage of our students of color that graduate from high school and also in terms of the, uh, their proficiency in some of the standardized testing that they take throughout school. So Kathleen and her colleagues are committed that we provide a quality education for all children in the state of Minnesota. And what can they do as a primary uh, you know, school preparing teachers in this state? Well, they're working closely with school districts. They're providing opportunities for uh, employees who are already working in schools to become fully licensed teachers. They're creating pipelines to attract more students of color into the teaching profession. And they're also developing courses to ensure that all of our teachers in the state of Minnesota are really advanced in their understanding of multiculturalism. So that's second. And the third would be the Morrison Family College of Health. Again, it's about addressing disparities. It's about really dismantling structural barriers in our healthcare system that really are not allowing all people and all families to be healthy or stay healthy. And the Morrison Family College of Health is going to be, really reflect St. Thomas's, I think, Catholic mission of putting the sacredness of the human at the center of everything we do. And it's really going to be about how do we create these healthcare providers and leaders, whether they're nurses, social workers, mental health counselors, people working in public health or other areas of the health fields, how do we help them treat the whole person in context of their family and their communities? So those three, in terms of advancing the common good, I think are just really enormous accomplishments of this strategic plan. And then I'll move to my second category, which is our mission of really being student-centered. We have always been a university that has put our students at the center of everything we have done. And I think three of those accomplishments uh, in this strategic plan, one would be the new undergraduate curriculum. 
uh, our faculty work diligently to really develop a curriculum that keeps that strong liberal arts emphasis and foundation, but is more integrated and more flexible for our students. So that would be number one. Second would be our Center for Well-Being and really being concerned about the increased mental health needs of our students that they're coming to us with and ensuring that we have the resources on campus to meet those needs, but also not in a fragmented fashion, to meet those needs in a way that we are looking at their entire health needs. So to combine our primary health services, our mental health services, and all of our services that really create um, prevention programs and resiliency programs and, and really wellness programs in one place. And thirdly would be our two-year residency requirement and all of the things we are doing to get ready for that in terms of building our two new dorms, our, our um, new dorm for first-year students, our new dorm for second-year students, and the renovations that we're making in Ireland and soon to start in Brady and Dowling Halls. So we have the quantity and quality of living space on this campus that all of our first and second year students can be living on campus and fully engaged in their education as well as their co-curricular activities. So those would be, I mean, this is a great plan and it has not sat on the shelf for the last five years. So much has been accomplished, but when I try to really sum it up as briefly as I can, even as long as that was, that's where I would end up. It is exciting when you actually sit there and yeah. list it. Yeah. Uh, another thing that's exciting is hearing your State of the University and two big announcements that really stand out mm -hmm. was the fact that University of St. Thomas is going to go test optional yeah. and also uh, a very generous donor has uh, put up a scholarship that's going to mean so much to students. Can you talk about both those things and why those initiatives are so important? You know, those are really important for both, I would say, economic reasons in terms of the future of our university and continuing to attract students and flourish as a university, but they're even more important for moral reasons, our, our mission to advance the common good and our moral commitment to all who uh, really have the ability to thrive and flourish at St. Thomas. So the test optional is, you know, it's widely documented that the ACT and the SAT, the scores, are very highly correlated with family income. And for some students who don't come from the families that can really focus on that test preparation and the, you know, the tutoring and whatever it takes and maybe taking the test multiple times or maybe find standardized tests not really good measures of their own abilities, they find those tests a barrier to applying to college. And so they may not even apply to St. Thomas thinking that because they're not that going to do well, as well on that test as you know, I, we believe their abilities you know, would indicate if you look at other measures, may not even apply to us. So almost a third of the accredited US colleges and universities have gone test optional in this country. And I think it's really time that St. Thomas does that, eliminates that barrier. It will require, and Al Catron and his team will be the first to tell you this, but we have full confidence in them. It will certainly require additional work by our admissions team to really do a more holistic uh, evaluation of our applications in terms of GPAs and strength of courses and curriculum and out of class activities that people were balancing while they were you know, pursuing. Uh, but I'm really excited about it, extremely excited about it. And then the second thing was our Canthac Scholars Program. And uh, so the test optional will go into effect for students that start in 2021. But our Canthac Scholars Program, we're actually beginning to award right now. And so that will be in effect for students in the fall of this year. And it is a need-based scholarship program. The bulk of the funds, it's a, uh, thus far a $20 million gift, which is extraordinary. And it's an estate gift and we're selling real estate from the estate, so there, it, it may actually grow a bit more. But um, the bulk of it will be need-based scholarships. 
and it will allow us to uh, award approximately 30 new ones each year, 30 incoming students. They'll get a four-year scholarship that will be 10,000 in their first two years and 5,000 in their second, their junior and senior years. And the reason we want it to be higher in those first two years is to recognize the cost of living on campus and that our neediest students are getting this scholarship not only to help with tuition but also with living on campus. In addition, uh, just it will also allow us to establish an emergency uh, fund that will be available beginning next year to all students uh, if they experience some financial hardship during the year. Uh, we will have uh, up to, well, I think at least actually $50,000 each year to uh, use to help students who are experiencing some short-term emergencies. Absolutely, that's exciting. Yeah. Well, as much as there's so much positive going on, these are challenging times too oh, around the country yeah. and higher education yeah. and certainly here at St. Thomas. Can you talk a little bit about the headwinds that we are facing as higher ed in general and here at the University of St. Thomas? Certainly, you know, um, this is being talked about throughout higher education circles and beyond uh, because these headwinds have really been here for quite a while. Uh, we are facing demographic changes. Uh, somehow during the financial stresses of 2008, uh, people stopped having babies because they couldn't afford it. And uh, those uh, children would have turned 18 around 2025. But even before that, we have been uh, experiencing either declining or stagnating enrollment uh, in terms of high school, particularly in the Midwest. So uh, I would say fewer high school graduates today and even fewer tomorrow, that all of these colleges and universities are gonna be fighting for or competing for. Uh, so fewer high school graduates in terms of our undergraduate population. And then uh, high school graduates that on average are gonna be experiencing a greater need for financial assistance. So we're all facing that at the undergraduate level. Uh, we're also facing this kind of declining confidence in higher ed. People are questioning the value of a higher ed degree. They're looking at the changing you know, nature of work and are our degrees going to still be relevant for the jobs of tomorrow? And then thirdly, and this is particularly at the graduate level with adult learners, there's a changing and, um, and I guess more uncertainty about how, when, and what education people are going to work, want. And so there, people aren't flocking to traditional residential graduate programs as adult learners. They may want it fully online, partially online. They may not want a full program. They may want certificates. They may just want a non-credit course. But how do we keep up with the kind of upskilling demands that adult learners want and how they want it? Absolutely. Yeah. So as you look at some of these headwinds, and then also look ahead to 2025, we are in the process of imagining that next step, the strategic vision for 2025. What are the next steps as we move forward? Well, we are just launching the strategic planning process. And while uh, unlike St. Thomas 2020, I think uh, we have, uh, we're not starting with a clean slate. Much is in progress that was started uh, in really uh, with the work of St. Thomas 2020. But yet, just like St. Thomas 2020, we want a very inclusive and particip participatory process in establishing St. Thomas 2025. So uh, we have the co-chairs of our strategic planning committees, uh, Ed Clark and uh, Katarina Pattett, and they have just uh, launched a survey uh, really seeking input from our entire community, faculty, staff, and students. And so if you haven't filled out the survey, please, please do. We really want to hear all voices. Uh, beyond the survey, we will be collecting the results, making them widely available throughout the community, and really then using them to engage our community in dialogue, in open forum sessions throughout the month of March. And we will make as many sessions open as it takes to involve everyone that wants to be involved. 
So please let your voice be heard because what made St. Thomas 2020 so successful was that our community owned it. And our community really needs to own St. Thomas 2025 as well. That's good to hear. Good to hear that you'll be yeah. taking that input again. So a lot of talk on campus, of course, is the anticipated move to D1. <laughs> Roll Toms, right? Uh, how will all this play into it? Of course, we have to wait till the NCAA comes through um, and they're going to meet in April and we'll know for sure. But if it's as expected and we move to D1 in 2021, how will that play into all of this? Well, I'm really excited about the possibility of... Uh, I say moving to D1, knowing that D1 is not homogeneous in any way, shape, or form. We are not moving to the Big Ten. Uh, we are not moving to any of what are often termed the Power Five conferences that are really uh, very, very big athletic-focused programs. Uh, we're moving to what, or hopefully moving to what is termed a mid-major conference, the Summit League, for most of our sports, and then a non-scholarship football league for scholarship, the Pioneer League, uh, because the Summit League doesn't sponsor football. And then we'll have to join separate leagues for men's and women's hockey because the Summit League also doesn't uh, sponsor uh, hockey programs. But what, in essence, what this does for us is it puts our university story of academic excellence and a strong mission on a larger platform. It basically, and you would understand this given your uh, role, it basically gives us a bigger platform to tell our story. Not our story about athletics, our story about excellence in everything we do, and our story about our, mis our mission of advancing the common good. So, and if you look at the Catholic universities across the country that look most like St. Thomas, I mean, in terms of size and scope of programs, um, almost, well, every one of them, and if you look at the top 20 Catholic universities, which we are among those, if you look at the rankings in U.S. News and World Report, every one of them, other than University of St. Thomas and Catholic University of America, compete in Division I athletic conferences. So, and they use this bigger platform to tell their stories, and we want to do the same. Uh, I also want to say, uh, because I know there's two concerns, this will not change our student-centered focus. We will continue to put student first in student athletes. And that's what the other Catholic universities that are similar to us across the country do as well, as well as a number of other private universities and public universities. But it's our choice to do that, and we will stay committed to that. The other thing that I think people worry about with moving to quote division one is the financial implications. Mm -hmm. And it does cost more money. Uh, it costs more money to give athletic scholarships and it will cost more money to invest in some of this, the support personnel we will need and, and, and some facilities, a lot of our facilities are fine, but some facilities. But I believe that the size of the bite, of the financial bite, because we're not planning on pursuing scholarship football, because we are, you know, not going into like a power five or huge athletic conference. I believe the size of the investment we have to make is digestible, particularly given the pace that we're going to make it on, which is, you know, we will be in a transition period for at least five years probably going into these new conferences in terms of ramping up our numbers of scholarships. So I think the size and the pace, I think, are realistic for St. Thomas. And I really believe that uh, the uh, f fundraising will support much of this investment. It, it, we are already getting interest from donors uh, who want to invest in athletics. And what has really been documented across higher education is as your athletics fundraising increases, your fundraising across the university increases. Because many donors who may come in through the athletic door get to know the university more and end up investing in academic programs as well. 
That's really interesting. Yeah. And that's been documented across the country. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, I'm excited. I, roll I, toms. Roll toms. <laughs> roll toms. Right? We got our yeah. purple on. Roll toms. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, we mm. want to get your perspective on these phrases. And one by one, mm -hmm. I'm just going to say a phrase and you sure. can tell us, give us your perspective on it. Because we mm -hmm. hear these, but it's interesting to hear what you think of them. Yeah. Okay. Forward thinking. You know, forward thinking to me is anticipating. It's anticipating the needs of our students, our communities, our employers, and it's being able to really integrate across our disciplines and our functions to best meet those needs, meet those students, meet those employers, meet those communities where they are. To me, that's what forward, forward thinking is. Values-based. Values-based is, of course, continuing our focus uh, with our students of developing morally responsible students, ethically minded students, students with integrity. So really forming that moral compass within our students, as well as that care for others and that commitment to the common good. Premier Catholic. That is um, academically excellent. Uh, liberal arts based, um, human centered education, education that develops compassion and empathy, education that is concerned about the common good not only today but tomorrow in terms of intergenerational. We think about that a lot with climate change. And it really is about. Uh, people who respect the other and want to be learn about the other and be in respectful dialogue. And I hope it's about generating alumni who are going to bring joy and inspiration to our world. Partner of choice. That is about being the university that in particular we think about uh, our communities and our employers turn to. So if uh, we have a community that is trying to solve an issue, they come to us. We have the best thinkers. Uh, if we have an employer who feels like they need to uh, uh, upskill some component of their workforce, they come to us because they know we can provide whatever that education is and whatever format it's needed to do that. We've heard you talk about inclusive excellence. Mm -hmm. And when we, as we look ahead to planning and strategic planning, mm -hmm. what is inclusive excellence as part of that planning and part of our future? You know, I believe inclusive excellence is our calling uh, based on our um, identity as a Catholic university. Uh, it is to be welcoming and to accompany everyone in our community. Uh, I also believe that it is uh, about having a diverse community where we practice inclusive excellence. I believe it is about welcoming all thoughts, all perspectives, all people to the table and respecting them for being there. And I believe it's what students want today. I also believe it's what we have to be to be a flourishing organization of the future because I believe that all organizations are going to do better if they have diverse members in their community and if they are collaborating, to, collaborating together in an inclusive and respectful way. Absolutely. Well, we've been talking about change, yep. too. That's another big buzzword. <laughs> and I know this is just a brief yep. conversation. But as we look at St. Thomas and throughout society, when we're talking about change at St. Thomas, these are deep questions. But who are we? Who are we trying to be? Where are we going? I know you can't answer yep. that because yep. <laughs> be like a two hour conversation. Yep. But to, to some yep. degree, can you answer those questions? Well, you know, I think because of the pace of change, people worry that we're losing our identity. And that's natural. I, uh, but I guess what I want to say is, who are we? We are 
academically excellent. Uh, we attract great faculty. We attract great students. We provide a wonderfully rich liberal arts education. We provide a relevant education that prepares our students for this changing uh, world of work. Um, and we provide a values-based education. We have a strong mission. Uh, we are concerned about values-based education, and we also are concerned about uh, teaching our students to develop this commitment to the common good. So academic excellence, strong mission, and student-centered. That's who we are in a nutshell. I mean, we could elaborate on all of those, but that's who we are. And we're not trying to be anything different. It's just we have to continually strengthen how we pursue academic excellence, how we pursue our mission, and how we pursue being student-centered. We have to continually adopt the best practices of being those things. Now, so who we are, who we want to be, and where are we going? So where are we going? We want to take the strong reputation that we have earned in Minnesota for those factors, and we want to extend the recognition of that beyond Minnesota. We want people, certainly in Minnesota, but throughout the country and hopefully throughout the globe to recognize us for these things and to invite us to the table for, to solve important problems, to participate in important dialogues, and to really be the leaders of the future because of this. And those are some of the overarching themes that you've been talking yeah. about. If you think about uh, the things that we are doing, it's a lot. I mean, we are instituting flat tuition. We are instituting a residency requirement. We are going test optional. We have uh, revamped our undergraduate curriculum. That's a lot of things. But none of them are pioneering. All of those things are documented best practices for achieving academic excellence, for being student-centered, for increasing your student engagement, your retention, your graduation rates. For These are all things that you know, many universities adopted decades ago. We are doing a lot at one time, but they, the outcomes are well documented. And in some ways, doing them all at one time, we are leapfrogging. But it's important that we leapfrog right now and be really strong and well prepared for the future. But leapfrogging is, gives you a great advantage because your position now once you do it but it's hard and I want to acknowledge that it's hard and I want to thank all the people that are helping us do this and really position St. Thomas to continue to flourish. I want to speak also a little bit about the themes of the change you know we've talked about the themes being about academic excellence and student-centered but some of the themes, particularly on the operational side, and, and somewhat also on the academic excellence and student-centered side, are, are kind of themes that you hear across all types of organizations, whether you're a university or you're, we just had the leader of Best Buy here last week, or your Best Buy. Her themes were the same. It, about, it, it is about ensuring that your lens is always flipped to focus on the people you serve. She talked about her Best Buy customers. The people we serve are our students, the people that hire those students, and our communities. Always flipping our lens to them, what do they need, and then being sure that we are integrated, whether it's across our academic disciplines or across our operational functions, to come together with a holistic solution to what they need to really come together to best serve them as one university. And if you really think deeply about a lot of our changes, they'll all fit that theme. And I think that's why St. Thomas is flourishing today and will continue to flourish for decades to come. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Sullivan. We really appreciate your perspective, and thanks to all of you for joining us.